but we're really thinking about this idea of collecting, the urge to collect objects, the urge to display objects, and the spaces in which society, many societies around the world have to, to upkeep, to house these, these objects, and to most importantly, display them to a public. And so our specific focus for this episode are museums and their relationship with power. How are they created um, specifically within a Western context today? Um, how is it related to certain power structures? And how does the museum, just like the other topics in practices of viewing, frame a certain way of looking in its audience at the history of objects, be it art objects, be it um, ar ar artifacts from other cultures, be it species in natural history museums. How does it frame our way of understanding history as seen through objects? And so you'll be able to answer and discuss the following questions to these these following questions today. And a lot of these questions are very open ended and meant to be very rhetorical. I myself am not going to really give an answer to any one of these because they're very complex and there's multiple different perspectives and ways of answering or thinking about these. My goal today is to, to give you a history of the museum, a very truncated history of, of the museum, the modern museum as we see it today, and to give you a, questions, um, some problems that many people have noted about museum practices, and really let you make up your own mind and really think about these questions. So what are they? What, is, what are the different power relations created between the museum and its public, right? The museum, museums are often considered to be very privileged spaces, very elite spaces in society, right? So it has a bit of a, 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 an authority in relation to its public. Museums often see the public as who they serve, right, uh, for the most part. Second, do museums have an ideal public in mind? And this is a very fascinating question that I am excited to hear what you think. Uh, it might be uh, something that I ask you, a wink, wink, um, later on this week for your engagement activity. Because like I said, it's a rhetorical question. There's no right or wrong answer. Lastly, how can political and ethical demands change or interrupt exclusionary museum practices? So this goes for at the end of this episode, we're going to talk about some of the, the things that critics have seen as a bit problematic in how museums have organized their space and have organized the objects within them. So let's get started. Let's talk about the birth of the museum. And when I say the birth of the museum, the I mean the modern museum, the museums that you see in big cities all around the world have, have a similar type of model and look. You've probably noticed that, hey, there are similarities between the big museums in major cities, for example, the US, right? The Metropolitan, the Boston Museum of Fine Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, they have a similar architecture, they have similar design layout, exhibition design, logic. 
And so today we're really going to think about how did that come to pass? How did that become the standard for large museums that were really meant to be survey museums, that they're giving you a lot of different objects throughout history from different cultures, and it's meant to give you a little bit of everything. And so the modern museum, which was born as a place, a secular space, right? So this isn't a religious space. It has a very public oriented function. It was meant for public engagement, right? So it's there for an audience. That is its direct point of contact, which isn't the only, right? I, I, I've worked in museums, but specifically in fundraising. And there's another part of the modern, mu uh, modern museum that is very much engaging with uh, corporations for donations, wealthy individuals for donations, etc. <clears throat> but the main uh, goal of a museum is to serve a public. And through the presentation of objects that have some aesthetic historical value uh, and of interest to that public. And it is tight, the, the birth of museum is tightly bound to several other types of institutions that arose during a specific time, time frame. So the museum, the birth of museum is within the, the 18th and 19th century in Europe. So that's the 1700s and the 1800s. Well, what other institutions developed? We, we have um, hospitals, modern hospitals, modern prisons, right? Other types of institutions that, you know, were had different goals than the museum, but they were meant to be these places that have very specific function and they house things, be it art, be it people who are mentally ill, be it people who uh, have, have done some sort of crime. And this was part of a general ethos of this period of time in Europe to do this. And but when we're thinking specifically about the museum, we have to think about a, a, a few things at, at the top, right? Uh, nationalism, right? A lot of museums feature, especially in, in France and in, in, in America, highly feature highly their art, right? And there's a sense that they position, say, French art as the best art, right? Or American art as American art, that it is implicitly emphasized um, and placed within a history of art throughout the world as the highest. And so that there's a, there's a certain amount of nationalism and national pride related to these big survey museums uh, around the world. Um, also colonial expansion that happened during the 1700s and 1800s. If we're thinking about the collection of things, of objects from all around the world, um, colonialism had a big and um, and and, and this, this emerging capitalism had a huge impact. And we'll talk about that um, in, in a slide of, of where that came from. Democracy, that idea of serving a public and not serving just an elite class or just a noble class. That has everything to do with the democracy. And so art museums have this very democratic um, goal and ideal. And all of this is wrapped up in the Enlightenment, right? And I've talked about this before. The period of time that we're talking about, 1700s, 1800s, the Enlightenment as this cultural movement where the knowledge, right, to the populace is, should, be, should be provided freely that an educated populace is a, is a good populace because you create ideal citizens in the democracy, that when people are knowledgeable of a lot of different things, you can talk to each other and you can exchange ideas, you can debate in a healthy way, right? This is all part of, of the Enlightenment. And really, I mean, even today, the ideals of, of an art museum, especially its relationship to education, um, and um, diverse audiences ha have that same mindset, just, just a little bit more contemporary. And the influence of the museum mo model, right, um, has a huge effect. And so today we're gonna think about it um, historically as rooted as a tool of colonialism, right? 
but also as a site for adaptation and self-definition, right? The museum has a very complicated history. It has a colonial past, but in its more contemporary uh, forms, there is this movement to go to kind of understand its past, to acknowledge its past, but figure out ways of changing the museum model to adapt more to a local community and to redefine itself and its relationship to place and other places that aren't just the Western Europe. And so these are two sides of the, the our conversation on the art museum because they're two sides of the same coin. Museums are often at, always in a rock and a hard place, right? Um, there are things that are ingrained within the model itself that are uh, can be seen as problematic um, and this goal to change, right? So it's almost like it's about legacy and history and the new. And they tend to always be at odds within museum spaces. And that's why I say there's no right answer to the questions today. It's just about how we, 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 we understand it and our thoughts on it, and maybe even your own experiences within museum spaces that you've had that you were, you might you might have had a really good, a really good pleasant experience, and maybe you didn't. Maybe you saw something that disturbed you, or you know that 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 you critiqued, right? <clears throat> and so we're going to begin with this idea of collecting. So before we get to the 1700s, the 1800s, when the modern museum was really created and the model was established for them, we have collecting and, and humans have been collecting things, you know, you know, for a very long time. But if we think about collections of objects from different places and, and, and the idea of collecting in and of itself as this kind of display of power, of wealth, um, of knowledge, that's, that's a little bit different. And, and that really arose during the 1600s. And we see it very clearly in a lot of the painting and the culture of, uh, of Northern Europe during the Renaissance, during the 1600s, specifically in the Dutch Republic, which is now the Netherlands. And the Dutch Republic, they were um, merchants they had a strong middle class during the 1600s um, and 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 a lot of people had access to goods being imported and exported from all around the world um, as a consequence of, of colonialism as well as this uh, the emergence of, of of early capitalism and dutch identity was very much rooted in the fact that they had a strong middle class, that they were seafarers, that they um, that they had colonies, that they could bring in fruit and vegetables and different types of objects from all around the world, and they could house it. They had it in their houses. So collecting these items in your house and showcasing them to others when they came over was 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 essential to their identity and because of that we have a whole genre of paintings that are meant to showcase this very idea that the this society could collect these quote-unquote exotic right um to them uh objects um that not everyone had access to and these were often called vanitas paintings and this is a key word and these are still lives. So still life is just a, you know, a rendering of just objects kind of staged or situated in, in a certain, in a certain, usually on tables, right? And the Vanitas paintings are still lives that have a lot of sim symbolic value. So these aren't just objects on a table. Each of these objects is saying something. And what are they saying in Vanitas painting? Well, all the objects are designed to remind the viewer of not only of their mortality, right? And the wor the, the and, and of the worthlessness of worldly goods and, and pleasures. Um, and this might seem kind of antithetical to what I just said about uh, uh, Dutch identity being ingrained in showcasing the wealth 
of collecting. Well, they were also very, very Protestant. And there was this idea that even though you have wealth, a lot of wealth, you should be humble about it and it shouldn't be everything. And so often enough, these paintings of things uh, that they have were, were meant to say, hey, you can step away, right? You, this isn't everything. But also, on the other side, it was very much reveling in the fact that they even had these things to contemplate, say, okay, I can step away from. And this wonderful Vanitas painting from Edward Collier uh, called A Vanitas Still Life with a Flag, Candlesticks, Musical Instruments, Books, Writing Paraphernalia, Globes, and Hourglasses. Look, look at all of the, the focus on globes and maps. And we have the, the flag of the Dutch Republic, so this, this strong nationalism. And we have this page of this book, which is detailing the travels of different ships and, and different places from around the world. We have uh, a map here of South America where, you know, the Dutch um, were, 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 were one of the many places the Dutch ships were going to, right? We see that this entire Vanitas painting is saying, this is what objects say. This is what a collection of objects say. They, sh they show power, they sh show worldliness, and they show a certain kind of middle class taste um, and acceptability. And so we can already see the seed of what would be the, the collections of these of early muse museums, right? Of all of the stuff that middle class and wealthy people had that had to go somewhere um, after um, some like some revolutions. Where do we put all of this stuff that has been collected? Well, we put it in a storage space in a place we call a museum. But we're not quite there yet. There are other earlier uh, versions of what we consider a museum, prototypes of the museum, um, that also happened in the 1600s. And this is an example of these rooms that some people would have of just different odd objects, uh, specimens of different, uh, of different creatures, different artifacts, just a real mismatch of just very curious things that were very interesting, both from a scientific standpoint, but also from material science standpoint, but also just, um, you know, from just thinking about objects in and of themselves. And so the nearest thing to a museum in early modern Europe, they were called Wunderkammern, right? If we think about a museum as a space where things are collected and displayed, Wunderkammern, that, that, which is basically uh, in English, a, what we refer to as a cabinet of curiosities. So you would collect all these curious things, you put them together, display them, and the goal would be when people would come over to your dwelling, your home, you'd say, hey, come look at this room. I have a bunch of really cool stuff for you to look at. Very eclectic. And it was often, these, these cabinets of curiosities weren't for everyone. They were usually curious nobles, wealthy merchants like the Dutch and scholars. So people who had the means and, and access to a travel to distant places, bring things back, or um, you, know, you had the leisure time to go out and, and collect them yourselves or buy them yourselves. And this was also emerging at a time like the Dutch Republic of colonialism, right? That, that there were these new places that Europe had never been before, with totally different animals, totally different objects that could be found that were then brought back, um, gathered, and then put in these cabinet of curiosities to, to showcase them as curiosities, but also as a way of contemplation and figuring out where do they all fit together. And so th these cabinet of curiosities are very much related to how we see, we, we uh, see natural history museums. If you've ever been to a natural history museum, uh, that they're very fun, 
but they are very much about well how does this animal fit next to this animal fit next to the, what you know what habitat do they live in this idea of classification right we need to classify we need to identify we need to put everything in this very linear history right we need to organize it and rationalize it that way which you know both art museums and natural history museums do right so when we were looking at the Vanitas paintings, this is about collection, collecting as an expression of power, nationalism, domination, right? Um, and then we see these Wunderkammern, these cabinets of curiosity as that, but now we are looking at, well, how can we categorize, right? I, we need to make sense of all of this stuff. So I have a couple more examples of cabinets of curiosities in different forms. Um, like the Vanitas paintings, they were very much uh, uh, a genre of painting, of, of just being able to paint different uh, open cabinets and showcasing different objects that the artist saw or knew about and creating these really fantastical scenes. And some cabinets of curiosities were literal cabinets. I have an example in the next slide. Um, fit, and they usually were fitted with, they were like cupboards with glass and drawers. And so there's this aspect of excitement and the unknown, right? That you, you don't know what you're gonna see when you open up a drawer or open up the case. And so there's this element of surprise and wonder that is also a key component to how all of these objects um, were displayed. And much like um, museums, um, and very different from you know, other types of collections, such as in churches, you know, church churches have treasuries um, or uh, you know, displays of, of war booty, the spoils of war, right? We have um, these Vonderkommen, which meant to very, to hit audiences psychologically, right? To deepen people's knowledge of the natural world, the visual world, through the presentation of things. So here we see that presentation starts to become also very important, right? We, we just don't have a room with a bunch of shelves where it's like, where does everything fit? How can I classify this? Now we can say, well, how we put things together can create wonder, can create a better sense of understanding, uh, imagination, right? And so we can play with how we, we, we put objects together. And here's a wonderful example of a phys an actual physical cabinet of curiosity. Um, but these are, you know, these are considered early instantiations of museums, but they are very different from the, from the modern museum, right? Uh, why? Because, like I said, cabinets of curiosity were owned by very wealthy elites, right? They were typically located in elite houses, palaces, um, and they were only opened really to the collector, right? So if I had this wonderful cabin of curiosity from Augsburg, Germany, um, from 1630, which happens to be the city where my mother was born, um, this would be in, say, I'm a wealthy collector, this, this would be in a space uh, accessible to me, and this is where I would put all of the things that I collect, and only I get to, you know, every once in a while relish and open them up and have access to that, to that knowledge. And maybe an occasional visitor, maybe someone's by and I, yeah, once again, like uh, I'd say, hey, I have some cool stuff in here, right? There is an intimacy and a one-sided intimacy to the collection that modern museums will start to get away from, right? Because this is kind of an older model of wealthy people who have access to objects, to things, and, and they, they are the ones who can collect. Not everyone can collect, only certain people. And so when we think about the, the, the birth of the modern museum, there's going to be a change that happens, right? No longer are, are the wealthy going to be the holders and benefactors of, of these collections and knowledge, but now it's going to be a public, a general audience. And 
this is a move away from something that is called a princely collection. So those, you know, especially with artworks and different objects, the displaying it within a house only for you is uh, th this is an early model of the gallery space, is what we would see in, in more modern museums. And princely collections, um, thinking again about power, because that is our theme, they very much like the Vanitas paintings showcased very visually to visitors and everyone the means uh, and power of this noble. And not just the material wealth, but so Wunderkammern, right? These cabins of curiosities and these princely collections, were, were there was an idea that objects from all around the world from different times in history were seen as a microcosm of of god's creation right um this is a this is a society that is you know very still very religious and the cosmos in general right um which the cosmos is greek for universe so there's idea that if you can house and showcase all of these things it's showing you something about the general world outside right that you are holding a little bit of the globe and a miniature reflection of just nature's awesomeness right human human uh, activities awesomeness right and so princely collections these you know walls covered with art that has been collected are to do the same thing with the with nobles who are often divinely placed into power, right? That if I have the power to hold all of this knowledge and all all of this art, then that showcases my my all powerness in in the larger sense that I can control a nation, I can control a town. So by controlling objects, you are by proxy able to control the, the the greater world and so the shift that i was mentioning right happened during the enlightenment particularly the important revolutions of the of the 17th century these are the revolutions like the french revolution and the u.s revolution against um great britain right they created nations right they were kingdoms before and now they are nations democrat democratically ruled by the people